Let's look at uh, Proverbs here. Look at this. Proverbs chapter 27. As water reflects the face, so the heart reflects the person. Whoa. So that's telling me when I look at the water, when I look at water, what is it showing me? It's showing me what I look like. And what he's saying is that I look at your life, I see exactly what's in your heart. Dang. So that tells me that the things of what's in the heart of man, really what's, what's inside, what's been sown in there is not invisible. It's interesting because we live in a world of the, we live in a, an age where I hear more than anything. I'm constantly hearing um, from uh, the church spiritualizes everything, everything spiritual. And it's interesting that when Jesus came on the earth, anytime he taught a spiritual truth, he revealed that spiritual truth in the natural. Anytime he taught about the kingdom and the power of the kingdom, what did he do? He healed the sick. He didn't just give you a theological idea to agree with and say, yes, that sounds good. I believe in that. I'm a Christian and I believe Jesus is Lord. He's the Godhead. I'm going to heaven. No, I didn't marry my wife for a marriage certificate. I didn't marry her so I could walk around saying I'm married and so the state of California could say that I'm married. I married her for that relationship, that intimacy. I married her because we would have a family. It's the purpose of God. It's that relationship. But if I married her for a marriage certificate, what am I missing out on? The entire relationship. See, this whole Christian life isn't about, oh, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm, Jesus is my Lord, and you say all the right things. That's good and all, but my goodness, don't, don't miss the relationship. God never intended, never intended one bit for his spiritual truths to not be experienced. And in fact, it's a tragedy on the church's part that a truth goes unexperienced or unseen or untasted by those around us. So what that tells me then is the fruit in my life is not a result of being a victim, is not a result of how I've been, uh, the, the, the certain opportunities I've been given, where some have been given better opportunities. Jesus proved that by being born into a cursed and poor family. If you go back in Jesus' line, I believe it's Mary's line, that king actually was cursed for sins he's did. And Jesus came into that line, and look what he accomplished. The result of my life is what's in my heart. Now that gives me great hope because now I know all I have to do is take what's in my heart, remove it, and put God's word in my heart, and I'm going to see God's word results. God's word is Jesus. Jesus, the kingdom of God and his power is in this word. Like I've shared before, uh, shared before that in a, 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 an apple tree, an apple seed, you plant that seed, it grows the entire tree. In that seed is all the bark, all the life, all the fruit that will come from that one seed. The seed of God's word, his promise, in that is filled with all the wisdom you'll need, all the, the faith you'll need, all the, the, the strength you'll need, the perseverance, the, the understanding and the faith so that when the, 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 the seed grows up and produces that fruit, that's what it is. Let's look at the next one. Proverbs 14.30, a sound heart. That word sound is the Hebrew word marpe, which means healthy. A healthy heart is life to the body. So the wisdom of God here is that, guys, your life, exterior life, is a result of your heart. A healthy heart is life to the body. 3 John verse 2 says, To my beloved Gaius, I pray that you may prosper in all things, and be in health even as your soul prospers. So it's not an exterior prospering and an exterior health that changes the heart. It's the heart that changes this. It's the inside that changes what's seen. Let's go to the next one. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. There's a lot here about the heart of man. Let's go to the next one. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So how many of us can agree with God and say, yes, I believe you, God, and if I've ever taken the wrong mentality, let's, it's, this is a perfect opportunity for all of us to take that little slap and say, okay, I'm going to change the way I think, I'm going to change in the way I see things and understand that it's my accountability and my responsibility of what's in my heart. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. He said to us, don't let it get troubled. 
So it's my responsibility and I'm accountable for what I allow in my heart. See, I can't control what you put in your heart. I can control what I put in my heart. I can greatly encourage and influence my wife and my daughter what is sown in there. No, we don't need that idea. See, there's, there's Jesus described it like this in, in Mark chapter 4, the kingdom of God. I'm getting to the, the whole point of the message, don't worry, but this is the foundation. I know it's a little slow, but I have to lay this foundation. Jesus said, the sower sows the word. So there's three concepts here. There's the sower, the seed, and the ground, the soil. The sower is you and I, the seed is the word of God, and the soil is what? The heart. And we find in James chapter 1, James says, with humility, receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So James reveals to us the, the correct type of soil for God's word to be sown in, and that's humility. You say, well, what is humility? Humility is simply this. I can do nothing apart from Jesus. With Jesus, I am everything. With Jesus, I can do all things. Without him, I can do nothing. That's pure humility, okay? That's the concept. That's the state of our heart. Jesus, you're everything, okay? Now, there's the, the first seed gets sown by the wayside. The next one on a hard heart skipping that. The third one, Jesus says, is the the seed is sown into the ground. It begins to produce. It begins to grow up. Good, good, good. But then what happens is the cares of this world and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word. So what happens is when the seed of God's word is sown in your heart, alongside the seed is also this thorn, this idea See, God promised me certain things, but then this this Bible teacher said something, and and I saw this person's life, it didn't happen, and I was praying for it, and they didn't get their answer prayer. What is that? That's a thorn bush growing up to choke the promise of God's unadulterated word. See, I can't keep you from listening to junk and garbage. I can only give you the pure seed of God's word. And it's for you to take that pure word and allow the Holy Spirit, like I shared, breathe on it. Let it come alive. And you see, we, when, we, when we read this without the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is what makes these letters, this ink, come alive. And it's just, it's just ink on pages without him, without receiving from him that coming alive. And that's why I said, keep reading until he breathes on it. Keep reading, and and I understand, trust me, I'm the first one to tell you as much as I read this, there's many times I read this Bible and I don't know what the heck I just read. And there's times I read this Bible and I'm like, man, this is dry as can be, Mike. This didn't make any sense, God. And I get mad, I get frustrated, and I, I, I don't yell at him, but I say, Jesus, what the heck? Why would you make it so complicated? Why couldn't it just be written this way? And it's always, it's never the way it's written. It's always my perspective on the verse. So he has to take me on this workaround through time and time. And then all of a sudden my perspective changes. And now I see, oh, that makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. But it's never him. It's my perspective. I was actually, real quick, I was uh, um, having this conversation with this guy that's involved in artificial intelligence and um, uh, uh, the quantum field. He's a, a scientist and everything. And he was sharing with me about his conversion to Christianity and how God revealed himself to him through science, actually. And it was a, 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 such an amazing conversation I had with him. And if you're listening, thank you, because um, he might listen to it. But um, we were talking about it, and he was talking about in the quantum field, uh, space and time is actually non-existent. And in in, in science can prove that there is no space and time in quantum mechanics. For him, that was revelation of how, how can God be in heaven and be in me at the same time. Because scientifically, it is proven that that's possible. 200 billion light years away, something happening there can affect right here based on quantum mechanics. That fascinates me. Anyways, the point of um, what I'm getting to is he started sharing within the quantum field that you can have two people experience the exact same thing and come out with exact opposite results. And he said it's all based on the perspective of the individual experiencing the situation. 
And he was sharing that with me. And that's scientific. That's not Bible. That's science. And I started, I was just blown. I'm like, dude, as you're talking to me, you know what's bubbling up inside? I'm thinking right now of the 12 spies that went into the land. They all saw the same thing. They saw the grapes. They saw the abundance. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey. And they also all saw the giants. They also all saw the fortified cities and walls. They all saw the impossibility of the situation. But two of them went in with a perspective of God is bigger than that. The others came in with the perspective that I am smaller than that. And they all came back with different results based on the perspective. Do you have a God perspective in life? Or do you have a Josh uh, self-introspective version of life? Everything will be too big for you, especially the purpose God has for you. God God didn't design your life based on what you can do. There's no glory in that. You get glory in that. What God's drawing us to and inviting his church to is to believe for the impossible, to see that God is the one worthy. Jesus is the one worthy of of a church that's filled with his glory. Jesus is worthy of a church that is healthy and strong and displaying his goodness throughout the world. Jesus is worthy of people with abundance that are able to do good and share. Jesus is worthy of this. That's a Jesus perspective. But we get trapped in this inward perspective. Well, I'm not worthy. No, you're not. Exactly. That's the point of the gospel. You're not worthy. Get over it. He is. We're living for his praise, not my praise. So I'm going to take everything and I'm going to believe God for big things because then even in the concept of, of imagination and prayer, God said I'm able to do infinitely more than that. Your biggest dreams, your biggest imaginations, your biggest prayers, God says I'm able and, more, and, and the power I have that's working inside of you right now is able to do infinitely more than that imagination and that prayer. That excites me. Let's look at this. Proverbs 13, 2, 12. So we see the importance of the heart and what's in the heart. Check this out. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. What does this mean? It means that a heart without hope is sick. See, there's something interesting about both hope and hopelessness is they are both extremely contagious. See, I've been told many times throughout my life that, Josh, your passion is cool, like you're fired up and stuff. And I don't do that to just get worked up and pump you up and try to get you because that doesn't really work. It might work for a moment. But I'm, I'm, I'm super stoked. I'm super excited about it. I'm excited about God. What is it? Is my heart is filled with hope. And that is hopefully contagious to you in your life to take home. And then guess what? That's contagious with other people. Now I get up instead and say, well, you know. The earth is going in a downward spiral. There's pain everywhere. But God will take me home one day. What, we leave here with zero hope, man. You're you're not even like the world. You're lower than the world because at least the world has some ambition to get rich or do something, you know? There's some kind of drive out there in in their hearts to do something. But, well, it just must be God's will. You know, like Eeyore. You know, I just, I'll just be on my way. And that becomes contagious. And I know in our minds, you're all thinking of that person that needs to hear this right now. The hopelessness, no, no expectation, no joy. Well, that's what, it's been there, guys. The Bible said it. Hope deferred, which means hope is drawn out. There is no hope in a person's heart. What happens is they become sick. And what happens if your heart is sick? What happens to your life? What happens to your body? We just read. It affects every area of your life. It comes down to what is in your heart as far as hope goes. And again, this word hope, we've shared many times. This word hope isn't like today's translation of the word hope where we think like, oh, I'm hoping and praying. Hope is a maybe. That is not the biblical word. And I wish today's new translations would change to adjust that so that when you read the word hope, you see it in its full meaning, which is confident expectation. Confident expectation. And every time it's used in the New Testament, it's a confident expectation of good. So to have any confident expectation of evil, 
is to be against the plan and purpose of God. I don't make plans for tragedy because I'm not expecting tragedy. I'm not expecting sickness to come and take my body and, and destroy me. Why? Because I have a confident expectation of good. And we're going to get to why here in a minute, but I need you to see the importance of your heart and in your heart having a hope and expectancy bubbling up and how it will, this isn't just something in vain. Like, okay, I have hope. But what do we, did we just see in, in the wisdom of God is that when your heart is filled with hope, it manifests, it shows forth in your entire life in your body, in the issues of life, your perspective. Everything changes when you have an expectancy of good. Everything. And this isn't just a, a positive, think positively message of, of some new age thing. Uh, I'm just going to think positive and ignore the, the pain and, and ignore that and then it, it'll be good. That, that's, that's baloney. We're talking about truth. This is the seed of God's word, which is the only source of truth in existence. This is what I'm expecting. Amen. Proverbs 26, I would have despaired, David said, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have despaired. I would have been down. How many of us have ever been at a place, two hands up, where you felt really discouraged? Yeah, yeah. I was actually uh, golfing with a pastor recently, and I asked him, he's been in the ministry for 40 years. 40 years pastoring, and I asked him, I said, what would you see, because we were talking about um, the length of people staying in the ministry, and he's been in so long, he's seen people come and go in ministry, and I asked him, what would you say the number one reason, he knows more people, there, there's, uh, how do I say that, there's, there's more people not in the ministry today than there are in the ministry over the years, and I said, what would you say is the number one reason people leaving the ministry, people leaving the pastorship, and he said, discouragement. The number one reason is discouragement. Well, that makes a lot of sense to me because what was the reason for Elijah running away? Discouragement. Elijah got discouraged because Elijah thought, hey, guess what? Revival's coming to Israel. Look at all this that's just happened. The, the people are going to repent, and there is going to be revival. In fact, it, 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 Elijah saw it this way, that Sunday night at 6 p.m., there's going to be so many seats filled in this auditorium that it's going to be overflowing. And then guess what? Sunday night comes, and uh, that doesn't happen. What happened was Elijah got discouraged, and he allowed that discouragement to really take over his life. And God showed up and said, when Elijah ran away, God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? God never sent Elijah to where he ran away. But isn't it interesting? In the midst of his greatest discouragement is also the greatest manifestation of God's voice. That there God was in the midst of his discouragement to get the message of cross. What are you doing here? I didn't send you over here. Now get some sleep. And he had an angel come and feed him. He's there to get you out of discouragement. And we see here David is saying, I would have been in discouragement except I believed I would what? See the goodness of the Lord. What is he full of? He's full of an expectancy of what? The goodness of the Lord. David is expecting to not just agree with the idea that God is good. We come and sing songs, God, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. And then, you know, we go home and the bills are due. The, the dog is sick. This happened. This happened. This person doesn't like me. This person's talking junk on me at work. This one over here is doing this. And now all of a sudden we forgot all about God is good. And now we're focused on the problems of life. And guess what? You just fell into discouragement. And it said in the midst of, yeah, but God is good, and I'm expecting to see his goodness over here. Yet God is good. I'm expecting goodness over here. God is good. I'm expecting goodness over here. What are you doing is you are elevating God and the perspective of God above this physical, ridiculous realm that is influenced by the eternal. That is really faith. And you're not denying the problems, but what you're doing is you are expecting something different than what the devil is offering. See, the devil's offering you on a silver platter fear, worry, anxiety, stress, and torment. Why? He wants you discouraged. He wants you to quit. 
Like Elijah, he wants you to end the ministry early. He wants you out. He wants you to stop thinking about the kingdom of God and start thinking about your kingdom so that you'll do nothing for the kingdom. See, all of us have the potential to be God's all-star team. There are some people that will do more for God than others. And it's not because the person is special. It's not because the person is called to greater things. It's because that person just believed. That person believed what? The goodness of the Lord. Because even Paul said, I labored more abundantly than all of the others. Paul was an all-star. He said, I labored more abundantly than all of them. But watch what he said. But not me. It was the grace of God in me that made me who I am. It was the grace of God. And where does grace abound? We see that grace abounds in rest. When you are resting, he is working. That's called grace. That's called grace. When you relax and rest, I'm not talking about just physically because Jesus was the most restful person. He was also the busiest person. But it's an inward rest. It's an inward peace. It's an inward where I'm resting. I'm not struggling. I'm not toiling. I'm, not, I'm trusting God. And we which have believed do enter that rest. It all comes back to what you believe about God. Are you allowing the thorns to grow up and choke the true nature of God? That's the question we all have to ask ourselves. What is in there? Because again, I can't control what you hear. I can't control what, what even Angela hears. I can control what I hear. And I can strongly influence and encourage it. You don't need to watch that. You don't need to listen to that. That's not going to help you. That's not good. No, open this up. Open this. Even if you don't understand what you read, your, your, your spirit does. Keep going. Just, just keep going with it. Let the Holy Spirit. And, and that's the thing is we eat sometimes three meals a day, sometimes more, sometimes less to keep our physical body strengthened, right? It's the fuel for our day. You don't eat for a day. You wake up the next morning, you're tired. Well, hello. Your spirit is what gives you the issues of life, the heart. And we, we, we go with a, a quick fast food meal on, on Sunday night, you know? And this isn't a co condemnation. This is not a, a anything. This is a, an encouragement that, look, when I read this, I'm not becoming this. I'm seeing who I really am. I'm seeing how much God loves me. I'm seeing what he's accomplished and what he's done for me. That's one of the things I've had to learn because I used to, well, I didn't read my Bible today, so, you know, I'm not who I am. I'm less than I could be. And I realized, my goodness, I don't, I'm not reading who I'm going to become. I'm not reading about what's going to happen. I'm reading about what has already taken place. I'm learning and growing in the knowledge of Jesus. Jesus put it this way. This is eternal life that you know the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. This is eternal life that you know Him. This is eternal life that you know Him, that relationship, that knowledge, that intimacy with Him. Paul said it this way. It's my determined purpose that I may know him. Paul, what about all the churches that you're planning? What about all the mission uh, stuff that you're doing? What about this and that? No, no, no. All of that is a result of my intimacy with him. All of that is a result of my knowledge with him. Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's interesting because both tasting and seeing is done. Where? Spiritually? Just saying, sometimes we spiritualize things a little too much. I want you to, if you guys have your, I don't know if you have your Bible or if you have a, a, a phone Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians real quick. I think I have it on the screen too. I'm going to blow by this real quickly. But there's, a, there's the point, that was the foundation, but it's not going to take long. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 7, now if the ministry that brought death chiseled in letters on stones came with glory so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. Okay, what are we talking about here? What does that even mean? So Paul is talking about two different covenants here. 
He's talking about the one covenant is the ministry of death and condemnation, which was given to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. You guys following? So on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the law. And what Paul is saying is that law, that covenant that condemned you and administered death to you was glorious. It came with glory. Now, what is glory? Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Verse 18. Then Moses said, Moses and God are talking, talking about going into the land, the promised land. And God says, you, the, you, the people are stiff-necked people. I'm not going with them, but I'm going to send my angel. My angel will provide everything you need. It'll, it'll win the battles for you. You'll have the land flowing with milk and honey. It's yours, but I'm not going with you. And Moses says, God, if your presence ain't going with us, I do not want to go. What is Moses after? The things that the kingdom brings or the king himself. You see, there, there's the, there, you can see this all throughout the Bible. There's this desire to know him and there's this desire for his presence. And then there's others that are just after the, 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 the peripheral blessings. Now, that's fine for the world, you know, because they're drawn by the goodness of God. They see the blessings. The, the people saw Jesus doing the healings and the gifts and all that, and they came to him and came to him. But the disciples were with him, and yet they even kind of failed in the intimacy part. For instance, that the, the woman, the Syrophoenician woman and the centurion knew Jesus and who he was by nature even better than the disciples. Because Jesus said, I have not found such great faith, no, not even in Israel, Israel, which they were a part of. So this centurion who was not even with Jesus had greater faith than those disciples who were with him. Because they became familiar with Jesus rather than intimate. We can come f familiar with the gospel, familiar, yeah, Jesus died. But what does that mean? What does that mean for your life right now that Jesus carried your sin, that Jesus carried your sickness, that Jesus gave you a future, a hope, a destiny? What does that mean for you right now? That's what I love it. I love asking myself, slapping myself, wait a minute. What does that mean right now? Here I am standing in orange. What does that mean right now? And begin to talk to yourself. Begin to find out what does that mean? Who is he? Who is, what is his nature? And this is what Paul is revealing to us here is about really the nature of God. Because he goes on, uh, Moses says, if your presence isn't going with us, we ain't going. I want you and that's it, period. And Moses says, dude, you found favor in my sight. Let me kill all them. Let me destroy all them. I'll make you a nation of your own. And Moses said, no, Lord, don't do that, because then the enemies will see what you've done and, and everything you said. But, but, but if you do that to them, then cut me off too. Humility. They, they, you're not, they're not looking for the stage. You're not looking. Uh, I can get on, but I'm not going to. I need, to. I need to focus. Then Moses said, please, let me see your glory. Interrupts God. They're having a conversation, a productive conversation about destiny and stuff. And then Moses says, I want to see your glory. And again, like I shared last week, that if I was there, I would have said, Moses, you've seen his glory. The burning bush, the fire by night, the cloud by day, the glory over the tabernacle, the, uh, all these different things I can point, the, the miracles, the, the, the frogs, and all, you know, the, the, all that stuff. And you're asking to see his glory? And what does God say? Because we're wondering, what is the glory of God? God responds, the very next verse, verse 19. He said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Moses says, I want to see your glory. And God says, okay, I'm going to let all my, my goodness pass before you. So he asked to see God's glory and God showed him his goodness. And when we fast forward to John chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, when Jesus turned the water into wine, which was the first miracle he did, the first sign of his power, that it says that this first sign Jesus did in Cana manifesting his glory. So it was a miracle of pleasure. It was a miracle of, of pleasure, of luxury. It was not a necessary miracle. 
His power wasn't used because there was even someone dying. It was because they were having a wedding party and the mother said they ran out of wine. Do what Jesus says. And that drew from what? His glory drew from his goodness. And when you understand God, you understand that his entire glory and all of his goodness has a purpose and it's for you. So if the mom says do it, guess what his glory does? Goes and does it because it's for her. His glory is his goodness, is his power, is his working. Jesus said that Jesus, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Okay. So back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So the glory of God. So he said that this old covenant where Moses was, when Moses, okay, real quick, when Moses saw the goodness of God pass before him, God said, you can't see my face, you'll see my backside. Okay, I believe God was waiting to reveal the full extent of his glory through the face of Jesus because when, when Moses saw the glory of God there, the backside of God, the goodness of God, his face began to shine. And his face began to shine that all the Israelites got scared and said, put a veil over your face. So he took a napkin and put it over his face so they couldn't see. There was glory in the law, the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of death, the ministry of who you're not, what you can't do, and what you can't have. Why? Because of sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the... Oh, so that tells me the original purpose and design of man was for his... Because when sin came, we fell from his... His goodness, his power, his presence. So what did Jesus do? Jesus in John 17 said, Father, the glory that you have given me, I have given them. The glory, the goodness that you have bestowed upon me, the love, the grace, the intimacy that you have given me, I have given them. What had happened? Jesus restored us even greater than what Adam and Eve had in the garden. Guys, sin. Sin was dealt with. Sin was dealt with. I was sharing with Angela. I was just doing a quick read through. I love reading about the cross. I, sometimes I just open up the Bible, and if I don't know what to read, I don't have anything on my, my head or my heart to read. I'll just go straight to John uh, 18, 19, and just read about the crucifixion. And every time I read it, something new comes, something new. And I was, and I was reading it just recently, and I said, hey, check this out. I said, you know, that, remember when Peter took his sword out and cut the, 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 the servant's ear off? I said, check it out. They go to court, right? Servant says, hey, that guy Peter cut my ear off. He needs to be killed for cutting my ear off. And the judge says, well, show me the evidence. Well, if you know the story, what happened was right when he cut his ear off, Jesus took the ear and put it back on. So guess what? The evidence of that sin is where? So is there any judgment for that sin that did happen? Why? Because it's, where is the evidence of your sin? gone it's in that dead body we did baptisms last week the evidence of all your sin your entire lifetime of sin and you go to court and the judge says okay well then show me the evidence now certainly did peter cut the ear off yes we're not denying that but show me the evidence jesus removed all evidence of any sin stain or unholiness we have ever seen Isn't Jesus amazing? So that you and I can walk in his glory. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that's why I preach so strongly not to have a sin conscious. Because if you have a sin consciousness, you won't be able to receive and believe and see from the perspective of God's glory. Because a sin consciousness is what? I've fallen from his glory. No, I'm, you know, yes, you're not worthy. We know that, but it's time to remove that consciousness of yourself and see that Jesus lifted you up with him. You're seated with him in heavenly places. Take that place of authority. Take that place that God did for you and believe it. And he's talking about here the two covenants, the glory that existed then. And what is Paul's conclusion? Look at verse uh, 10. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was set aside was glorious, what endures will even be more glorious. Since then, we have such a hope and expectancy, we act with what? Great boldness. 
we act with great boldness. Now, why? 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 What is this? What am I saying? The, the glory that came from the law, which administered death and condemnation to you, who you're not, who you're not, you're short of the glory of God, had glory. How much more the ministry of Jesus saying, you are clean, you are holy, you are spotless, you are righteous, exceed much more in glory. In fact, Paul goes so far to say that the glory of this new ministry This glory of you being righteous by Jesus is so much more glorious. The glory of the old does not even exist. It can't even be seen anymore because of the glory that remains. Now, what am I saying? In Exodus chapter 34. No. Exodus chapter 40. Verse 33. Next, Moses set up the surrounding courtyard for the tabernacle and the altar and hung a screen for the gate of the courtyard. So Moses Moses finished the work. What am I talking about? They finished the tabernacle of Moses, the place where the Ark of the Covenant would dwell and the place of worship, the, the place of sacrifice, where the animals would be sacrificed. It's where Jesus, a picture of Jesus in the Ark dwells. Now this tabernacle was made with human hands. I want you to remember that. And this tabernacle is in the old covenant of the law. And what happened? The cloud, verse 34, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord, the goodness of God filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Let me explain to you what that cloud is. When the presence of God shows up, sickness and disease and pain and stress and anxiety cannot. Because Jesus said, kingdom come will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when that kingdom comes, that will that's done in heaven is done where that kingdom is. So God says, I want you guys that have my kingdom and have authority in the earth because of what Jesus accomplished, spread the knowledge of my goodness, of my glory throughout the earth. So I can't help it that when you start talking to me about how you're anxious and stressed out and full of anxiety, the kingdom of God in me cannot allow that to continue. So I must tell you about this Jesus and the peace that he's given you, and I must stretch forth my hand and pray with you right now because the kingdom in me has more power than that pain in you. So what just happened is that's the glory of God intervening, invading the kingdom of darkness. And where is darkness when light shines? Gone. The glory, the goodness of God fell on this tabernacle made with hands. And this tabernacle wasn't anything real special other than it was an exact replica of the one in heaven. And other than, and I don't mean that I shouldn't have said it that way because it was beautiful because it's all a picture of Jesus. But what I mean is it's not made with marble, not made with, um, you know, it's not like, never mind. It was made with goat skins and beaver skins. You understand what I'm saying? Now fast forward to Solomon and Solomon builds the temple. Second Chronicles chapter five. I got this new Bible. I love it. It's perfect. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 4. Um, Solomon finished building the temple. His father David provided the majority of the substance to build this temple. And this was a beautiful, gorgeous temple, still made with human hands. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites picked up the Ark of the Covenant. They brought up the Ark, and they placed the Ark in there. Verse 11. Now all the priests who were present had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. When the priests came out of the holy place, the Levitical singers dressed in fine linen and carrying cymbals, harps, and lyres were standing east of the altar, and with them were 120 priests blowing trumpets. Isn't that interesting? There were 120 priests blowing trumpets, and trumpets blowing the trumpets is always a picture of our words, of our mouth, and what is coming out of our mouth. And there's 120 priests here blowing trumpets, praise to God, because the temple here is finished, and the presence of Jesus, the manifest presence of Jesus is inside. We just so happen to see that on the day of Pentecost was fully come, thousand years later, that the, the apostles and the disciples were gathered together in the 
upper room. How many? 120 of them. And the Holy Spirit fell and filled them and 3,000 people got saved. And what they did is when they came out speaking in other tongues, the people heard the wonderful works of God being proclaimed. The Levitical singers were descendants of Asaph. Uh, verse Verse 13, the trumpeters and singers joined together to praise and thank the Lord with one voice. They raised their voices accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and musical instruments and praise to the Lord. And look at what they were, look what they were shouting. Look what they were singing. This is it. For he is good. His faithful love endures forever. For he is good. His love endures forever. When did God decide to show up and manifest? It was when their eyes were on how good he is and how much he loves them. The very next verse says, the temple, the Lord's temple was filled with the cloud. And, be, and because of the cloud, the priests were not able to continue ministering for the glory of the Lord filled God's temple. When they got their eyes on his goodness, it wasn't even the temple made with hands. It was that when they got their eyes on his goodness, he filled the temple. Last one. Haggai. You don't have to turn there because you won't find it in time. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. For the Lord of hosts says this, once more in a little while, God says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. This is a declaration of the Lord of hosts. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first. Now we're talking, don't forget, about expectancy and what you're expecting. The old covenant, these people could expect God's glory to a degree. But this new Covenant is much greater in glory. In fact, it's the full aspect of God's goodness in the face of Jesus Christ. This new glory, God says, this new house will be greater than that of the former. Now, remember, we just saw the tabernacle of Moses, and then we saw the Solomon's temple. What is this new temple? What is this new place? Well, it's not a place made with hands. Human hands built that. God's glory anointed. God's goodness and God's presence was there. This is the temple of you and I, not made with hands, but you and I are made with his own hands. We are living stones built as a holy temple unto the Lord where we offer our sacrifices of praises and thanksgiving to our God. How much more, Paul is saying, how much more glorious, how much more should you have an expectancy of seeing and tasting the goodness of the Lord under this new covenant than that of the old? And because of this expectancy, we act with great boldness. We act with great boldness. Why? Because I have such expectancy of seeing the goodness of God in my life, of tasting and seeing the goodness of God every day. I am drawing from his goodness. I don't deserve it. I did not earn it. It is not wages. It is because he is good. It is because his love endures forever. I, my mind, my eyes are on he is good. He is good. And understand, you cannot know God apart from his goodness. You cannot know God apart from his goodness because God revealed himself through the Son, Jesus Christ. Look at the very next verse, uh, verse 13. Where we are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from gazing steadily, uh, verse 14, but their minds were hardened, for to this day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. So what does that mean? Is that because of the law of them being, per their perspective of seeing who they're not, because they've fallen short of the glory of God, the law is telling them who they're not and what they haven't accomplished. They read this and they do not see God. They do not see his glory. They do not see how good he is. And that's my point is you don't know. The devil disguises himself as a preacher of light. He goes around and, and disguises himself. And some of the harshest words Paul had were for preachers that brought forth a gospel that was different than Jesus, than that of Jesus. What I'm saying is those thorns and what's in your heart can be nothing other than what Jesus revealed. The, the law of Moses you and I are free from, not so that we can just go live any way we want and live crazy lifestyles, but rather we can live for Jesus. We can serve him in a new heart and a new spirit, righteousness of God, doing good works full of his spirit where he's moving within us and he's moving in us and transforming our lives. But the veil, the law, will keep you from seeing who he truly is. And so look at this. When one turns to the Lord, or when, yeah, whenever Moses read, a veil lies over their hearts. Verse 16, uh, but whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now notice this, it does not say when the veil is removed, they turn to the Lord. Right? It's not that the veil is removed first. Because many will think, well, it, you're something special. God removed the veil for you to see. 
No, 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 no. I just turn to the Lord. What does that take? Uh, humility. That's the, you realize that's what the law was designed to? Designed to do was to humble you, to see that you are helpless, you are hopeless, you have nothing in and of yourself to be equal with God or to, to be brought back to the glory of God. So what do you do? You see Jesus as your Savior. Oh, I'm going to turn to him. And guess what? The veil of who you're not is removed. The veil of what you can't do and what all of your uh, evil and everything wrong with you is removed. And what are you beholding? The glory of the Lord. And what happens when you're beholding the glory of the Lord? You're set free and you're being transformed into that same image. Seeing Jesus. Seeing the fullness of who Jesus is. God expressed the fullness of his nature through Jesus. The fullness of his... That's why I have such a problem when people go around bringing human theological ideas and adding them to the scriptures. Not one person ever came to Jesus and left without what they came for. Not one. Now, if there was one, then I can adopt that type of theology. But when I adopt a theology because somebody I know went to Jesus and didn't get it, and I change this to match that human experience, I'm in error, and I am not revealing the goodness of God. Because the goodness of God is to be revealed through who? Jesus and Jesus alone. That's it. He is my standard of God's goodness. I don't create a standard, and I don't let anybody else tell me what the standard of God's goodness is. I tell, let Jesus reveal to me the goodness of God. And Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good to your children, how much more your Father in heaven, who is perfectly good, who has no evil nature, will give good to them that ask him. And Jesus didn't clarify it. He didn't get scared. Well, what if they, get, what if they ask him for this? What if they ask him for this? He didn't clarify. He full stop, boom, period. And we're so worried about what people ask God. Ask God. He's your dad. He's your good dad. He loves you. If it's, if it's important to you, it's important to him. So many times we think he's just uh, in the big details of life. No, no, no. He's in the minute details of life. The small things that may not be important to anybody else but are important to you, that's what he cares about. That's where he is, and he wants to be a good dad, and he wants you to taste and see his goodness. He wants you to see how good he is. And this Jesus revealed that Father. Jesus revealed the perfect, beautiful nature of the Father. Who is this Jesus? I'm, closing, I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. In Colossians chapter 1, who is this Jesus? I want you to see. He is the image of the invisible God. Well, there you go. No one has seen God at any time, but guess what? You see Jesus, you've seen God. You want to know what God thinks of this? Look at Jesus. You want to know what God thinks of poverty? Look at Jesus. What did he do? He went around giving to the poor. In fact, Judas was stealing so much money because Jesus carried a money box. I know, you know, the, the idea of Jesus not having any resources, it sounds good in churches around the world. But no, Jesus had, had an abundance. I mean, he was providing for over 70 disciples at one time. That's payroll, food, lodging, travel expenses. That adds up, right? Anyways, he gave to the poor. If, if you were sick, if you had a need in your body, what did Jesus do? He, he fulfilled that. He gave it to you. Why? Because that's the goodness of God. That's the will being done in heaven as it is on earth. It's not, see, there was a woman with the issue of blood who snuck up and grabbed healing from Jesus. Remember that? And she was healed immediately. And she wanted to run away because she wasn't supposed to be there. She thought, I just snuck up and grabbed this healing. You know, maybe he doesn't know about it. Maybe, you know, because maybe if he did know, I don't know if God would be happy with that. What does Jesus do? Jesus stops, turns around and looks at her and says, daughter, the only woman he ever called daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, what happened is this woman who thought she just took it from him without him knowing, Jesus could not let her leave with that idea that she stole it. Jesus could not let her leave without, without her seeing the goodness of her father. So he turns to her face to face, and now she's looking up, and she is beholding the glory of the Lord. She's beholding the glory of God, the goodness of the Father, of the Creator, shining from the face of Jesus through his eyes, and she hears, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be whole of that disease. Now she knows not only did he heal me, but he wants me well. 
He wants me in peace. He wants me to continue living in this realm of peace. The goodness of our Father. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. If He's the firstborn, I'm like the millionth born. For everything, I don't know, maybe billionth, I don't know. For everything was created by Him. Whoa. In heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. So, Jesus created what's visible and invisible. And if he's a creator of what's visible and he's a creator of what's invisible, that means he has authority in both realms, the invisible and the visible. And if he has authority in that place and he raised me up in that seat of authority, maybe it's because he, and, 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 and he left me here in this tent that's visible that he purchased that belongs to him. Maybe it's because he wants us to express the authority that he owns and that he has in this visible earth. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. Verse 18. He is the head of the body of the church. So Jesus is the head of the body of the church, and I love the way Ephesians says it. He is the head of the body for the benefit of the church. In other words, what God did in raising Jesus from the dead and lifting Jesus above all heavens to the highest place and raising us up with him and making Jesus ahead was not for Jesus' sake. It wasn't for God's sake. It wasn't for them. It was for you. Everything God has done in exercising and using his power has been for you. Everything God has done has been for our benefit. Wow. So that he might come to have the first place in everything. Now, I was reading this this week or a couple weeks ago, and this is what jumped up because I know it's coming. It says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. You read that, you can read right by it, and you think about that. And I have the amplified version. It says, for as pleased the Father that all the divine fullness is some total of the divine perfection, powers, and attributes should dwell in him permanently. Now, it it hit me like a freight train because I know what Paul writes right after this. But as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, okay, well, how do you contain God? You know, how do you bundle God up? You know, you take an avocado and you can put it inside a Tupperware and you can say that that avocado is contained in that Tupperware, right? The the fullness of that avocado is in the Tupperware, right? Everyone, well, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible, (laughs) right? Now, how big of a Tupperware would you need to contain God? It's impossible. You couldn't. Because as soon as you think, okay, I got the right measurements, you just realize, well, he's infinitely more. It's infinite. It's, it's not mathematical. Or maybe it is. Maybe that's why it's in. You can't contain God yet. And I've thought about that many times. I look up at the stars in the sky and I see how big God is. And all of that was with a breath. All of that was created with just a breath. Imagine when he flexed his muscle. What happens? Okay, that was with a breath. Next time he'll give a shout or flex his muscle. How do you contain him? And yet God, it pleased him for all of his fullness, his power, his perfection, his nature, his goodness, his glory, to be contained in his son, Jesus. Now, I jumped up and down and danced for a while and thought amazing things because of what Paul wrote just next. Look at next verse. Verse 27, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The divine fullness of all who God is. Guys, this is too big for our brains. It's too big for our imagination. The fullness of God, the fullness that there's nothing left out and he's pure good, there's no evil. Do not allow religion in your heart that says, well, sometimes, you know, even the, the thought of, you know, God allowing this bad thing to happen to someone, you know, that's just same as if he did it. Because if you have the power to stop something bad from happening to somebody and you don't, you're an accessory to murder. You're an accessory to that. So get this religious junk out of God having any relationship with evil. He has zero relationship with evil. In Isaiah 54, he says, look, when you're under attack, it's not for me. I'm letting you know, when you're under attack and the attacker comes, it's not for me. 
but I created him and I created his weapons. So guess what? No weapon formed against you will ever prosper. It's not me. The fullness of God, his goodness and everything he is, all of his power, everything he did in raising Christ from the dead for your benefit, for you, Jesus dying for you, carrying your sin for you, carrying everything wrong for you, being raised up for you, and now seated at the Father's right hand for you. Then God said, you know what? I'm not even satisfied with that. I'm going to make sure all my fullness dwells in my son Jesus, and then Jesus Christ is going to live in my people. The fullness of God is in me. And what did Paul, what's Paul's conclusion to that? An expectancy of what? Glory. I'm expecting God's goodness. Why? Because Christ in me. I'm expecting this to happen. Why? Christ in me. I'm expecting God's goodness. Why? Christ in me. Going around my house, going around my day throughout this, thought comes or whatever. No, I'm expecting this. I'm expecting good things. Why? Christ in me. He's in me. The fullness of God is in me. I'm expecting this. Why? Christ is in me. Yeah, but you, no, 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 no. It's not because of me. It's because he's in me. Yeah, but, 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 no, 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 no. Christ is in me. Christ is in me, the hope of glory. The hope of expecting, the the expectancy of tasting and seeing the goodness of the Lord. Why? Christ in me. And Christ, all the fullness of God, the Godhead, the deity is in him. And that's too big. I know, you know, it's too big for me to comprehend. It's too big. What? What? The fullness of who you are is inside me right now? With just a breath, you created this universe that we haven't even found the end to. And you're breathing on me. You're speaking to me. What is that going to create in my life? What is that going to do? Well, I tell you what, I don't know, but I'm expecting good. I'm expecting his glory, which is why when someone comes to me and they are in need, I don't need to send you to somebody else. Why? Christ in me, the hope of glory right here, right now. And when I pray for you, I am expecting God's goodness. Why? Because he has appointed me and assigned me in the earth to reveal the knowledge of his goodness everywhere I go. So when I pray for you, I'm not praying for you expecting because you were good or you did something right or even I did something right. It's because God is good. He loves you and he put Christ in me. That's why something's going to happen. See, Jesus didn't go around preaching. How many sermons did you hear Jesus preach about unanswered prayer? I didn't hear a single message in my Bible about unanswered prayer. I find things in my Bible that are so big that Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, my Father will do it. If you ask anything in my name, my Father will do it. That's big. How does Jesus have the comfortability to give you that full stop? Because Christ will be in you, the hope of glory. Because he's living within you, he's dwelling within you and moving. Did you guys get something out of that? Let's all stand.